to Kilens. I'm going to be touching on introduction to poetry. Is uh, that's one of the genres we'll be touching on in uh, paper two. It's the first section of our examination, which is our paper two. So we are going to get to the basics and do a touch up on what we must be focusing on, as we are going to be doing the twelve prescribed poems that we have been given. Uh, poetry is detailed, so we must be sure that when we're analyzing, there are certain things that we must be touching on. So I'm going to be talking about the introductory part so that by the time we get to the analysis of the poetry, when we come in and say, let's identify the diction, we must be knowing what we mean when we say diction. So those are the things we're going to revise and go back on since we touched on them at the beginning of grade 11. So now since it's a year later, we're going to touch on them and uh, try and remember what we dealt with when starting with poetry. Okay, um, I'm starting with the terminologies that we use in poetry. In front of us, we are having the terms that you must be familiar with. The first one is theme and intention, style, diction, tone, mode, form, the rhythm, the rhyme scheme, the imagery, the symbolism. So when we say terminology, this is the language that we use when coming to poetry. So we need to know that what do we do when the question asks us to identify the theme? So we're going to go to these things a little bit in detail so that we can be able to um, identify them when we have a poem in front of us. Okay. It's a repetition 12 times because we have 12 poems. So which means it's a repetition of the same things 12 times for all the poems, because every poem is a theme, every poem is an intention, every poem is a certain style, every poem is diction, every poem is tone, has mood, every poem is form, rhythm, and rhyme, every poem is imagery and symbolism. So that's why we have to internalize them so that we will not struggle when we have to identify them without wasting any time. Let's go to the theme. Right. When we're talking of the theme, we are talking about the main topic, general or underlying idea, the main concept of the poem. So it is also occasionally used interchangeably with a piece of writing's meaning or sense. So if we remember um, when coming to poetry, the, the title of the poem sometimes does not really refer to the content of the poem. So our theme is going to come from the content and not the title. So which means when we have to understand the main idea of the poem or the underlying idea of the poem, we will always find it in the poem itself. So always remember that it's not always where the title will tally with the content. Sometimes it can, sometimes it doesn't. But we have to read the poem and the poem is going to give us the underlying idea or the main topic or the main concept. And that's when we understand what we are dealing with. Themes are so diverse. We we can talk about culture. We can talk about tradition. We can talk about uh, um, tragedy. We can talk about loss. We can talk about uh, apartheid. Those are some of the things that we'll be looking at when we come to our poetry. So as a result, we must be able to know that this poem is dealing with the apartheid system. So our theme is uh, segregation during the apartheid system. A lot of our poems this year in grade 12 are dealing with the apartheid system, almost five or six. So as a result, it will be one of the most dominant themes in the five or six poems that are African. So that's why I'm going to use it in my talking today because our six poems that we'll do first are based on the apartheid system and the events that happened during that time. So as a result, sometimes we feel it's repetition, but it deals with certain things, different things. So it changes direction in each and every poem, but the theme doesn't change it. It will still be segregation during the apartheid system, or it can be uh, bloodshed during the apartheid system. So that's what we mean by the underlying idea that is there. So when we come to the second one, which is intention, it means what is the motive or the reason for the poet writing his poem? So, which means there are certain adjectives that we use when talking about intention. I will repeat myself. There are certain adjectives that we use when talking about um, intention. Is it to persuade? Is it to defend? Is it to express hatred? Is it to scorn, to protest? 
Is it praising? Is it raising an argument? Is it expressing love? Is it flattery? Is it a warning to criticize? Is it to bring sympathy in us, to enrage us, anger us, to mock us, to incite us? Is it to educate us? Is it to inform us? So those are the things when we say, when talking of intention, you must be able to find the right adjective to address the intention. So you must be able to understand what he is wanting to happen. That's what we mean by motive or the reason for writing the poem. So when he brings a poem whereby we see numbers of people being murdered, being expressed over and over again, I believe we understand that there is anger. So now we understand he's evoking sympathy in us. So his intention is to evoke sympathy in us for the bloodshed. His intention is to uh, enrage the, the audience so that they can take action or protest, whatever it can be. So you must be able to find intention is not general. Intention can come in each stanza. Intention can come in two stanzas or in the whole general poem. So we must be specific when looking at our poems to say, does stanza one really have a relationship with stanza two? If it doesn't, then it means stanza one might have their own intention. Or stanza one and two have this intention, which is different from stanza, stanza three and four. So we must be very careful when looking at intention because a line can give us a different intention from the next one. So as a result, there's one word that you can use, a one word or one line stanza, whereby it's really to capture our attention and make us stop. And we have to uh, um, understand something. So that's why we must be able to understand the intention, which comes line by line, stanza by stanza, or through the poem itself. Okay, our next one that we're going to go to is uh, the style. Every poem is its own style. So we must be able to understand the way it is written. We say style is the way that a poet will represent himself. Um, the, 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 every poet has their own defining characteristics. They have a unique way in how they present their poems. They don't use the same style. So as a result, when we're trying to understand style, we must be looking at how he or she wrote the poem. Sometimes it can be in different forms. For example, it can be colloquial. When we say colloquial, the language is going to show us because there's a lot of contractions there. Don't can't. So as a result, that's when we realize that, oh, this is informal language. So it's a colloquial style of writing. Conversational, it's almost as if there's a question mark and the response is coming in, as if it's a conversation between two people, so which means that's what we call a conversational style. Sometimes it can be someone asking a question and then the response is given, a different language is used and then a response is given now in English as an interpretation that becomes sort of a conversational style. An emotive style of, of writing in poetry is the use of emotive language. Remember in paper one, we talk about the use of certain words that will evoke emotions in us. And therefore, we become moved. So when we have those uh, um, words exceptionally, we now understand, oh, he's trying to extend the highlight that, or highlight the extent of how beautiful it was or how excellent it was done. So we must be able to identify the emotive language that moves us as the audience. And we are able to say that's an emotive style of writing. Factual style of writing statistics. I think I gave an example of the number of deaths that have happened. That's factual now. So as a result, we realize that this happened in a certain year and it gives us in 1978, that's a fact. So when the poet is going to bring facts into poetry, we call it a factual style of writing. We have humorous style of writing where there will be uh, 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 irony, uh, there will be sat satire, there will be um, sarcasm. So we must be able to identify those things. Or oh, use of irony. Remember, coming from our uh, visual literacy, humor is according to visual literacy. That's where we've been doing it so, for so long. Or we're talking about irony, sarcasm, puns. Uh, that's the use of humor. So we must identify that. Remember, we're no longer talking about humor in terms of funny. Humor is a skill. So humor is coming through the use of certain things. As I said, irony, pun, uh, sarcasm, 
So those are the things that we're talking about. Idiomatic style of writing through the use of idioms as a way of not saying it bluntly, but as a way of bringing it out in a form of an expression or a saying. So we must be able to see what the author is using, sorry, the poet is using so that we can be able to identify the style. Sensational style of writing is when there's elevation of emotions. It becomes so outstanding. That's, that's, what, that's what we call it becomes sensational. So when you say it's a hint, it's also something which is now brought distinctly clear. There is no way you'll be asking a question, but its clarity is there. That's what we mean by sakint. When you say test, test is you can tell there's an emotion of withdrawal whereby a person doesn't really want to say it fully, but really has reservations about it. And therefore, there's a little bit of a conflict in it. So that's what we mean when we talk about styles of writing. Those are just examples. There are so many. Each poem has its own style. When we are going to our list of poems, you realize the style that is, is, is used in Sonnet 130 is not the style that would be used in a child who was shot dead at Nyanga. So as a result, that's when we realize that poets use different styles of writing. We move on to diction. Diction should be very clear to you by now because we do it even in paper one. Whereby we're talking about the choice of words and language. So as a result, the poet intentionally chose the words and the sequence of those words to achieve his goals. Keep in mind that not all words have a set meaning. Rather, the precise meaning of a word depends on its context. Word sounds, word sounds could also be significant. Every phrase a poet uses should be viewed as a tool to further his meaning. So when we're coming to diction, we're talking about words that have an impact on us. Remember, when we're doing diction, we must quote. We are not quoting a line as we are not quoting a sentence in paper one. We only take words. So we take a word, put it in quotes, and discuss it. So when we're talking of diction, there's a certain word that we're going to remove and another one somewhere that we're going to remove in another line to say these words have a certain impact in that stanza and they are bringing out something. So that's what we mean by the use of diction. Okay, we move on to tone. Tone is the poet's attitude towards his subject and towards his readers. So when you say his subject, it's the way he said it. So when we are reading it, we are supposed to be hearing his voice. So it will be the way he has said it. So the tone can be determined once one has examined the poem thoroughly. The tone also varies within poems. It's not the same. The other person, the other poet can write in an angry tone, which means you can hear the tone. The other poem can write in a, in a, in a sad tone, whereby you can hear the somberness in his voice. So when we are reading the poem, we are not reading it and hearing it from our own voice. We must understand that when he is saying it in this way, that shows an angry attitude. So which means the tone becomes a tone of anger. It can be sincere, can be humorous. Irony if it states a humorous tone without faith. Pun if it states a humorous tone without faith. It can be a forceful tone. When someone forces you to say, Amanda, salute. That is forceful because that's a, a, a revolution and it's forcing you to also revolutionize. It can be a critical tone where he questions things are being done. Sarcasm can come in in a tone whereby you can see him criticizing certain things that are happening and you don't even know exactly why he's going to criticize or what he's going to do. So when you're coming in, you must be able to listen to his voice from the way he is expressing himself in a line, in a stanza. So when we are reading our poems this year, let's listen to the poem's voice. If we listen to the poem's voice, if someone is going to be talking about, I remember when I was a child, that is a sentimental tone because that's nostalgia. A person is bringing memories of when he was a child alive, which means they still adhere to him and, and he holds them so close that they are alive. That's a sentimental tone. That's a nostalgic tone. But when someone is talking about be, uh, uh, how he lost things as a child, and then you realize, oh, that's bitterness because he still wants those things back. So you must be clear. For example, we're having a poem that is Fen Hill 
in our list of poems. Fenhill is about the poet remembering his childhood in the countryside, in the beautiful greenery of the countryside. That's when we know it's a sentimental tone, nostalgic tone. But we also have a poem that is called uh, uh, Shipwreck, whereby uh, men are lost at sea, and then only if only four survive out of the shipwreck, that is what we call a melancholic tone because there is a tragedy that happened. So when we are coming in into our poetry, let's listen to the voice according to the way he expresses himself and you'll understand. I'll give an example. When your friend takes something from you that you don't want and as a result forces uh, uh, himself on you and takes it, and you don't want him to take it. The way you're going to respond to him because you're going to lash out at him. When you lash out and you tell him, I don't want you taking my things, that then we realize is an angry tone. That's a forceful tone so that he can understand. But you cannot be simply saying, leave my things alone. Now that's gently, that's a gently tone. But when you are lashing out and saying, I do not want, and you are emphasizing, that means it is a forceful, angry tone. So we listen to them when we're reading their poems. That is what's going to give us our tone. Mood, this refers to the poet's diction or word choice. When we say to accomplish his objectives, he purposefully selects words and their placement in the text. Not every word has the same meaning. Remember, there's a word where there's a denotation. There's a word where there's a connotation. So as a result, the sound of words may also be important. Every word a poet chooses should be seen as a tool to help him express his ideas more fully. The mood is always brought out by the uh, environment, the setting, and the atmosphere. So if we're talking about people who are in the apartheid era and they are being arrested, they are not free, then we realize there's no joyful mood there. There's no way you'll have a joyful mood, which means we're having a somber mood. We, we are having a depressed mood. So you must be able to find out from the words he uses of descriptions of the place, of the environment, and of the uh, atmosphere. That is what's going to give you your mood. So we must be careful when doing our poetry to understand. If you are in a church, the mood is not the same as the one you will portray when you are at a party. In a party, it's a, it's a, it's a joyful mood. It's a carefree mood. At church, it is a reverent mood because we are praising and we are showing respect to God. So which means the moods are not the same. So as I said, atmosphere, environment, setting is always going to determine us. All right, we go to the form of the poem. When we say the form of the poem, we're talking about the structure. The examination, I think there's a time when they say with reference to the form, or sometimes they can say with reference to the structure. So which means form is another word for structure. So these two words mean the same thing. So in the examination, they might use form. If they don't use form, they are definitely going to use structure, but they will not use both of them. So in the back of your mind, you must come in knowing that or oh, the form is the structure or oh, the structure is the form, and then you'll be fine. So our structures are not the same. They may be rigid. They may be prescribed. They may be loose, undefined. Remember in grade 11, we talked about free verses. We talked about uh, types of poems. That's what we mean when we're talking about the form and the structure because our forms and structure were not the same. A majority of us did Sonnet 130 in grade 11. And the lucky part for you is that it is one of our prescribed poems in grade 12. So hopefully you were listening because that's one poem where you should totalize because you learned it thoroughly in grade 11. It's coming back again in grade 12. That's one of, uh, uh, of the poems that we call a sonnet. The structure is a sonnet because it is prescribed. You will have one line 1 to 12. You will have line 13 to 14. And therefore, you will have uh, um, uh, quatrains whereby line 1 to 4 deals with a certain content, line 5 to this. So that's what we mean when we're talking about the structure. I'm going to talk about the types of poems because that's very important for us to understand. The first time of type of poem is a ballad. When we say a ballad, it is started as a song, which means it might have a verse, passed on from one generation to the next. The characteristics that we're moving on to of a ballad, fast moving story, rhythm is very pronounced, you can feel it when reading it, rhyme pattern, 
It can be rhyming or it can be alternate rhymes. Remember, we're coming to rhyme later on. We talk about it fully. And as a result, we are now talking about poems that are in very short stanzas, narrating pure popular stories without rhyme pattern or an unpronounced rhythm. So that's a narrative poetry, So which means it's almost like a storytelling. So when we're talking about narrative poetry, we are talking about sort of a storytelling that is happening. You can, it is a poem, but unfortunately, there is some storytelling that is happening. So that will tell you that, oh, okay, now this sounds like a narrative poetry. When a person goes back to their youth and comes back again to their present, shows regrets, you know, takes you from their childhood, continues to their adulthood, that's what we call a narrative poetry. Okay. All right. So when we're coming in, we're going to the odd. I'm on types of poems, so I'm going to come here to the odd. That's another type of poem. It's a poem often in the form of an address. And in an exalted style, in praise of something or one. Whenever there's going to be heavens, God coming in, then you understand that is a sort of a praise. It is exalted in both feelings and expression, written in rhymed stanzas. It expresses the speaker's admiration. I believe you have so much nature poems in K-12 this year, whereby you're really going to be talking about the beauty of the sunset or the sunrise. So as a result, and then talking about the blessings God giving us the grace to see that. So you are going to be looking at such, and that's where you realize this is in praise of the beauty of nature. In feelings, is in reverence, is in awe of how beautiful God created nature. Talks about the 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 sight, the the, the senses are awakened. Talking about the sight, the flowers, the greenery, and all those things. So that's what we mean by an art. Usually we see this in nature poems the majority of times. We go to our next type of poem, which is an elegy. This is a song of lamentation or mourning. Um, I believe we did, um, what is this poem that you did in grade 11? Meet and break, yes. You did meet and break in grade 11, whereby he loses the brother, the poet loses the brother, and he has to be taken away from the boarding school where he is, Put in the sick bay, waiting for the neighbors to come and collect him, and then he's taken back home. I believe that's what we mean by an elegy. I hope you did that one because that's one of the poems that we did in grade 11, a majority of us. So it's a song of lamentation or mourning that honors someone or something that has died. Can I correct this one, please? Because that is wrong. It is definitely not this one, but we are talking about uh, this one. When you're talking about mourning, we're talking of the crying. So it's a song of lament lamentation or crying, mourning that honors someone that has died. Subject matter is treated in a suitable, serious fashion. The father is crying. The mother, the, the father is, is bereaved and is no longer the strong person that he knows. The mother cannot stop crying. So we're talking about a sad and mournful poem in tone, which expresses the speaker's sorrow. So those are the things that we'll be doing and say, is this poem an elegy? Is, is this poem an odd? You must be able to know this when we start our poetry. We have a lyrical poem. It is much more emotive that it usually conveys feelings. It's a short poem that deals with a single theme or idea and expresses the speaker's feelings, definitely. So as a result, a lyrical poem will always see there's so much emotion in it, but it is a short poem. But there is only one thing, there's only one idea, so which means we'll have to know our poems very well to know if we have a lyrical poem or an elegy or we are going to an allegory. It is the representation of abstract ideas or principles by characters. Once again, the allegory makes use of the story form. And it is long, but it, is, it either has a religious theme or it contains a moral warning or offers advice to the reader. Uh, fortunately, I don't know whether you've read the book Animal Farm, but as a result, it's one of the poems that taught us about uh, communism and all these things that you do in history. So it was an allegoric book. And as a result, they used the pigs as characters, not to portray uh, the actual Napoleon, who is who was, you know, you, it, all those things. So Napoleon was a, a pig, though Napoleon represented the characteristics of the leader. Um, in that time, who is Napoleon after all. So as a result, that's what we mean. So abstract ideas are given in a different way. So that's what we mean. 
When we're talking about rhythm now, those are the types, types of poems now we've got on to our language in poetry. We're talking about rhythm and rhyme. Learners confuse this a majority of time, so we need to distinguish between the two once and for all. Rhythm is the follow of the words or beat in a poem. It is the repetition of recurrence of stress. Meter is the term used to describe the measurement of regular rhythm. The function of rhythm is to emphasize or endorse the meaning of the words in a poem. It can also help to create a particular mood or atmosphere convey a particular theme or a set or a particular pace. When we say stress, repetition or stress, syllables are the ones we're talking about. Syllables are words. When we talk of syllables, for example, we're going to talk about this. When you're talking of syllables, we're talking of S, T, R. That's three. And then we're talking of uh, 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 cream. That's a syllable. So now we have syllables that are in the high we have syllables that are in the law. So I'm going to use these two to show you the difference. Syllables that are in the high are syllables like, for example, when we say lullaby, lullaby. When we say lullaby, all these are low syllables, so which means they are not high. But when we say uh, a, a word that has high uh, syllables, they are all emphasized and they are all stressed. We are talking about extreme all of these are high notes, stream. All of them are high notes. So as a result, we're talking of syllables that are either high or syllables that are low. Lullaby, it's a, it's a, it's a soft syllables, so which means they are low stress. But when we're talking about X, that's already a, 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 a stress that is being pulled and therefore it is a, on a high note. So as a result, when we say they emphasize or they endorse the meaning of words in a poem, that's where you look at the stressing part. So which means you look at the syllables, the stress part, the cr part, that's what we mean, the la part, the by part, or the ba part, so it's low. So that's what we mean by rhythm. Rhythm is in words. Can we be clear? Rhythm is in words and the syllables. So when we're talking about rhythm, please remember, we are touching on what we call syllables of words. Remember, we break words into uh, syllables. So each word might have extreme. For example, extreme is this syllable, X, stream, stream, and that one. So we break our words into syllables, and that's what you get. Rhyme, it is the repetition of similar sounds. For example, we have an end rhyme, which occurs at the end of the lines of the verse. Remember, our poem is in lines. So which means we have line one, two, three, four. Now what we do is this is our poem. That's line one, that's line two, that's line three, that's line four. So when we're looking at rhyme scheme, we're looking at the, when we say end rhyme, we're looking at the last word of each line. So when we're looking at the last word, we're looking at the uh, uh, what is there. For example, they gave us time and crime. When they are the same, in line one, if it is time, for example, this is the last word in line one. This is the last word in line two. They rhyme. So which means we have A, A. So which means we'll have A here and A here because those two words are rhyming. But if we're coming in and we're going to have C, T here, it doesn't rhyme with time and crime. So which means it will be B. If we are having a uh, um, lime in line four, we are going back because it rhymes with time and crime, which means it will be an A again. So when we're talking about the rhyme scheme, we're talking of the end rhyme, whereby we look at the last words of each line and we're saying, do they rhyme? If they do rhyme, it means it's the same, which means in line one, it will be A. The rhyme scheme now becomes A, A, B, A. So we look at the last words. So if they don't rhyme, it means the pattern of the alphabet continues to the next one. So if it means if they are not rhyming throughout the whole poem, it means it's an, uh, what is this, irregular rhyme scheme. So when you realize that there is no rhyming that is happening, we are saying that the poem is an irregular rhyme scheme. But if we are looking at a poem and we are realizing that there is a pattern, then we call it a regular rhyme scheme. 
So those are the differences of our rhyme schemes that we're going to be looking at. We usually use our end rhyme. So as a result, we must be able to find that as much as possible. I'm now going on to imagery. Imagery is what we call our figures of speech. So as a result, it comes in two ways. The first imagery is the visual imagery. So imagery comes in two ways, whereby we have visual imagery, whereby it's a picture painted for you in words. So if the picture is painted for you in words, it becomes a visual imagery. So as a result, it can be the word that is evoking an image in you, or it's an image that appeals to your senses, or the heart, or the mind, to your emotions. That's what we call our visual imagery. But now, when we're also talking about imagery, we're talking about figures of speech on the other hand. We are still having a problem with this one. People cannot identify a person, personification, cannot identify uh, ellipsis, um, um, hyperbole, cannot identify um, um, simile, or differentiate between a simile and a metaphor. So as a result, we must be able to train you to say, by looking at a line and reading a line, a poem for the first time, at the back of your mind, a, a bell must ring to say, that's definitely personification. That's definitely a, a metaphor. That's definitely a, a metonymy. That's definitely a simile. So as a result, you must be able to identify them. So as a result, how do you identify them? You must be able to know them first. So this is something that, it's not all of them, but it's something that we might use for today. There are so many as we're going to be doing them in the 12 poems, and you'll understand that each poem has different types. For example, some poems can have hyperbole, some do not at all. Some can have euphemism, some do not have at all. All right. All right. We're starting with metonymy. You are having it in one of your poems this year, so you must be knowing it. Um, substitution of the name of something for that of the thing meant. For example, and plows down palaces and thrones and towers. So as a result, palaces, they've been clear, clarified. It's towers. So as a result, that's what we mean. So it's a substitution of the name of something for that of the thing meant. So as a result, we must be able to identify the substitution itself. We are going to do it in detail and it will make more sense as we're doing the poems. But now we're just outlining the things that you must know and what they are. Sinedoch. Uh, Sinedoch is a part. A part is named, but the whole is meant or understood. Or the whole is named, but only part is meant or understood. He's back to the five thin healthy head grazing. So as a, a result, head is used. Head meaning a group of animals, of cattle. For example, because it's a head of cackle. So as a result, that is what we call Sinet Dodge. Another one that is in our poems this year is reference to men. Men does not refer to the male in some of our poems this year. It refers to the whole uh, humankind. So as a result, that's a common term, and therefore we call that Sinet Dodge. Hyperbole, exaggerated statements, not meant to be taken literally, but it is an exaggeration. For example, I crumbled to the floor. So when you say crumble, it's almost like you've been broken into pieces and you practically chopped and on the, no, that is hyperbole because that's just an exaggeration of how the person falls down. So you must be able to by identifying the exaggeration of feelings, exaggeration of descriptions in poems, and you will be fine. Euphemism. Substitution of vague or mild expression for harsh or direct one. He passed away. We don't say he died. So we use euphemism when we say he passed away. We don't say he died or he is dead. No. We use a, a more soft, a more uh, uh, acceptable way of saying it, a more subtle way, which is not direct and blunt and can cause pain. So that's what we mean by that. All right, these are some of the useful terminology. We're moving on. Rhetorical questions. They are dominating a majority of times. Why? At times, they do not need an answer from us, but it is to draw our attention to the statement and makes the reader stop and think. And as a result, when you stop and think and ponder, it means you become more involved and might have a different answer or the actual answer as well. 
apostrophe this is addressing an inanimate object or an absent person so as a result which means milton that out living at this time i believe we did london 1802 in grade 11 london 1802 was in reference to milton one of the great authors and poets of the times whereby he's being called back to come alive and save uh england so it, it starts off with milton thou art living at this time so when you address a person who has passed away directly as if they are still alive that is what we call apostrophe when you're going to bring an inanimate object and bring it alive, that is what we call apostrophe. It makes ad the address more closer, more real. And as a result, that's what we call apostrophe. Pathos, quality in writing that excites pity or sadness. So when they are making us feel this pity and making us feel more sad as the poem continues, we call that pathos. So that's a feeling that comes out and that's the atmosphere that is created, creates a mood or an atmosphere of pathos whereby we have to be sympathetic now. And as a result, we are so sad. We feel pity, but we can't do anything about it. Enjambment. This is part of an, a free verse poem. I believe um, we did this in grade 11. There were a lot of free verse poems. So when we're talking of a free verse poem, one of the main distinguishing characteristics of a free verse poem is enjambment, whereby we realize an idea is started in line one, but the idea is not finished. Instead, it is continued over to line two. And as a result, that's when we realize, oh, okay, this is what we call the enjambment. Continuation of a sentence beyond end of a line. His state is kingly, thousands at his beating speed and post over land and ocean without rest. So this suggests continuation. So strengthens the meaning of lines which state that something is going on without stopping. So as a result, it, it's a fluent movement. It's almost as if he, the poet is so eager to tell you more that he can't stop. He's, it's almost as if it's so urgent that he cannot pause it. And therefore, he takes it over to the next line. That is what we call enjambment. So we're bringing in and saying when we're coming to free verse poems, whereby there is no regularity in structure, you we will get a lot of enjambment. When we have inversion, this is reversal of normal grammatical order of words. When we say normal grammatical <laughs> order of words, we're talking about how, how will with this rage shall beauty hold a plea? Shakespearean language is usually our reverse anyway. So we're saying how with this rage shall beauty hold a plea whose action is no stronger than a flower. Now we must understand the word order is wrong and therefore it creates something which is grammatically different. That reversal of grammar and the order of words is what we call inversion. So we must be on the lookout for it. And then satire. When we're talking about satire, um, satire is ridiculing prevalence, uh, prevalent vices or follies. The follies are there, whereby you see something is wrong, but as a result, we now know, are, are really going to make fun of it and really not be harsh about it. And therefore, that's what we call satire. So now we're coming in and saying, we realize the corruption that is happening, but we say, oh, how shall we survive in this Lord shedding? That is satire. You are not saying it in an in a, in a insulting way, but you are making fun of the Lord shedding to say, how will we, you know, survive? It's almost as if we, we are surviving we, we, with the Lord shedding. We, we used to it now, we're even anticipating it, but we do make fun of it and amusement. And that, what, that is what we call satire. Dramatic irony is when the reader is aware of the fact which the speaker is unaware of. This gives the speaker's words a double meaning, whereby an announcement is made, but you already know that announcement is not going to happen because someone has already said in the poem that this is what is going to happen. So that's what we mean by dramatic irony. You are aware as the audience, but the poet is not, or in a novel or a play. All right. Um, understatement is representing something as less than it really is. After the floods, when things were carried away by the water, we say we've had some rain. After floods, the key word is floods, which means when we're talking about floods, it means houses are taken away, landmarks are taken away. So now when we come in and say we've had some rain, that's an understatement because we had more than that. So which means if we had houses moving away, it's not just some rain anymore. So that's what we mean by an understatement. 
All right. When we're coming to climax, event or point of greatest intensity or interest. I think you've done this in novels. What are you talking about? Where things really break apart. And that's when we realize this is the boiling point of this poem. This is the boiling point or whatever is there. But anticlimax is when there is an ineffective end to a poem. There was a climax. There was a, a, a confusion happening. There was a lot of things brought up. Now we're expecting a solution right at the end. But instead of getting a solution, we are left hanging and there's no conclusion or the conclusion is unsatisfactory. And therefore we are let down as the audience to say, ah, is this how it ends? Is it not, not going to end with a revolution happening? It's not going to end with people taking up arms and going into the streets. But it ends with people just saying, we shall wait and see. People are dying in the streets and the poet is describing how people are dying, how people are being killed, but doesn't say people now retaliate. So that's what we mean by an anticlimax because we're expecting something to happen from the way he described the climax. That's why we're saying it creates a let down feeling, a feeling of disappointment and dissatisfaction is there. Allusion, reference to a specific person, place, event, or literary work in the course of the poem. When we refer to um, a biblical character, Jesus Christ, I believe that's what we call an allusion. So it's reference to the Bible. So it's an allusion to the Bible. So which means we need to listen closely when reading what is referred to at that time. So that's what we mean. All right, these are some of the continuation of the figures of speech that you know. If you realize at the top, they started with those that you don't know much, but that are going to be touched on this year. We've done personification so many times. The cow is stubborn. When you give a cow qualities of being stubborn, you've personified it. So as a result, that's what we mean. Similarly, as long as there is a like or an as, you look for this, then you know. That's a simile. She is like a bee because she's busy. She is like a bee. She is busy as a bee. That's a simile. But when we come in and say she is a bee without using like or as, but we have compared it to a bee, it means it's a metaphor. So a metaphor does not use those two. They will not be there. Like and as will not be there. But the two things are still there. She is a bee. So when we say she is a bee, it is a comparison, but without, she is a bee. Um, but here we say it, she is busy as a bee. So as a result, we are talking about the as being there. She is a bee. The as is not there, but the comparison is still there. So that is the difference between a simile and a metaphor. All right. I'm going to talk about paradox because we're having it as well. A statement which is self-contradictory but which contains some truth. One is to be cruel, to be kind. When you say paradox, it's a contradiction. This is the key word. You, how is it that at the same time you're being cruel and hurt someone's feelings, but they're talking about kindness in the same line? So that's what we mean by a contradiction, though it is correct. Sometimes we must be cruel to be kind, but it's a paradox. Um... Oxymoron is a paradox containing, containing two words, rotten beauty. So when we're talking about rotten beauty, when we're talking about bittersweet, bittersweet is coming into my mind right now when we're coming in about oxymoron. So I believe when we're talking about, a, there's this thing which lime is. Lime, we do want that bitterness, but at the same time, there is that sweetness inside. But, so it's two things at the same time. It is bittersweet. When you say rotten beauty, beauty rotten, that's an oxymoron, a paradox, which is in two words, not in a line. The difference is that paradox is in a line, oxymoron is in two words. So when you say rotten beauty, bittersweet, we're talking about oxymoron of a word, two words that are, are showing contradictory things. There's no, you say something which is bitter because you'll scrunch your face when you're eating it, but at the same time, you call it sweet. That is oxymoron. Antithesis, opposites are contrasted or balanced in two clauses of phrases. The years to come seem, seemed waste of breath. A waste of breath the years beyond. There's a contradiction in some way. Contrasts are happening, opposites are happening. When you say a waste of breath the years beyond, 
now we have to come ourselves and say oh. when we say waste of breath it's 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 an instant but now they're talking about years so that is antithesis so cousin bitter or wounding remark ironically worded taunt attitudes feelings towards the person meant or addressed that's what we mean irony expression of meaning by language of opposite or different tendency he is a very sweet person but when we're bringing in now something else which comes in is a lion so as a result we must be seeing some of the things there and we're coming into innuendo when something is hinted at without actually saying it it is behind the lines which means they're not saying it properly which means they are withholding saying it bluntly which means they say it in a way that is uh hidden and therefore it is not upfront so those are some of the figures of speech who are coming with you know you cannot finish them in one day but i'm touching on those that you might have forgotten okay let's go to sound devices now okay sound devices are part of imagery but they are different why they use the sound of the words for us to identify them so these ones are also figures of speech that but they deal with the sound all right let's look at them let's look at this page because these are the sound devices that we're going to be dealing with okay here it says the following are not strictly figures of speech although they are often classified as such they are sound devices it is where the sound of the words is just as significant as the meaning of the words which ones let's see them those are the three We're talking about alliteration, assonance, anamatopia. So those are the ones that we're talking about here. We're talking about whereby when we look at the words that are used, we will see a repetition of the word or the sound, and therefore that's what we're talking about. Repetition is the re um, alliteration is the repetition of beginning consonant sounds. We're talking about beginning consonant sounds or in the middle or somewhere but definitely consonant sounds are repeated for example my dongles and my ever willing dust my death the d consonant sound is repeated so as a result that's what we mean by alliteration the consonant sound d is repeated assonance it is the repetition of vowel sounds in two or more words without the repetition of the same consonant and all is seared with trade, blood smeared with toil. So now the difference between alliteration and assonance is that alliteration is the consonant sounds, assonance is the vowel sounds. Remember our vowels are A, E, O, U. Those are the ones that we'll be looking for in assonance. But in alliteration, it's the sound, the D, the K, the, the R sound is what is we are dealing with when we say consonant sounds. Anomatopia, please spell it right. You're always spelling it wrong, a majority of you. So please learn to spell it right. Anomatopia went by the sound that is being made is depicted in the word. Forming words from the sound that resembles those associated with the object, the buzz, so snarled and rattled in the yard. So when you say the buzz, already the sound that is depicted, so we must be able to know that this is reference to the sound being made. So those are our um, uh, sound devices that we must be able to capture and understand when it comes to our poetry section. All right. There is a lot of symbolism in a majority of the poems we're doing, whereby an object is going to symbolize something, whereby something is going to symbolize something. So it can be a word or an object which represents or suggests an idea. So we must be able to know what they, when they're talking about tombs, Tombs symbolize death. So at the end of the day, the, 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 the object or the word tomb symbolizes something or suggests death. So as a result, when he says hungry tombs, when they are personified as hungry tombs, we are now symbolizing the rate at which people are dying, and therefore that symbolism. So quality or timbre of the voice, I think we've talked about this one um and we've touched on mood we've touched on theme at the beginning whereby i said we listen to how it is said so as a result let's go towards the end and look at the methods that we can use to analyze a poem treat each poem as a work of art consider the advantages 
consider the content. Have an open attitude and give the poet's voice some room to impact you. Our poems impacted us different ways last year. So as we come into grade 12, we must be able to understand the poet's voice and how it impacts us. So as a result, we always recommend that you read the poem at least three times. At least three times so that you can understand. Read it several times to understand it. Consider what the poet is trying to convey to the reader. Switch on. Try and gamble with, it can't be this, it can't be that. Consider identifying the topic and the subject. That can be easy to do if you understand the poem, which means if you have read it three times. Take into account the poem's motivations for creating the specific poem. Was it due to pain? Was it due to loss? Was it due to joy? So you must be able to find the motivation. Examine the poem's, the poet's diction in detail. The diction is always our key to poetry. That will make, make us understand what the poet is feeling, why the poet is writing the way he's doing, what the poet is trying to express. The poets, all these things, we must be able to get them from the diction. Consider the language and writing styles that were employed. Any words you do not understand or know, please look them up. In some poems, they do give you the analog, which is the uh, terminologies at the end of the poem, just below the table. And then they give you the meanings of the words for some languages or writings that are used. If it's a different language, they will translate it and put it down there. But it's not all poems will do that. For your prescribed, you won't have it in the exam because they assume that you have studied and you now know exactly the diction. So as a result, when you're looking at your poetry notes, mm -hmm. you will see that at the end of the table, you will have diction in detail. Um, establish the emotions the poet wants the reader to experience before evaluating the poem's atmosphere. What is he trying to portray to us? You know, what is his emotions? Is he angry? Is he depressed? Is he disappointed? So you must be able to get that. Examine the poet's structure to see how the poet used it to convey his ideas. Check out the poet's use of rhyme, rhythm, figures of speech, and sound effects. Examine each one separately to determine how it affects the poet or poem's overall success. List any more remarkable or peculiar characteristics. Determine whether the poet's intention was successful. Did he inform us properly? Did he convince us properly? Did he narrate to us properly? So that's what we mean by whether his intention was successful. So this is what we need to try and go through before we can go to our poem number one, poem number two, until we get to number 12. Might not be all of them, but it is the main important ones because I know people know some of the figures of speech, so I couldn't put all of them. I only put those that we forget and that we confuse, and then that's when we must revise them. So as a result, that's why it's very important that as we are coming to our poetry, we are able to understand that to analyze a poem, there are certain things we should do. So as a result, let's go through these things. Let's get them right. Let's make sure we understand them so that we can be able to identify them. Learners think poetry is difficult, but poetry is a study. So it must be studies. It, it does not come automatic. So that's why we must go through these notes. We tried our best to introduce poetry today and be familiar with those things. As we go to our 12 poems, we must be able to know these things. What is intention? What is style? And therefore, we can be able to understand the poem and extract what is needed. When we are going to answer the questions, whether it's context questions, essay questions, it's still the same. They will want the theme. They will want the intention. They will want the tone. They will want the diction. And you must be able to know them. So let's go through these notes before we can go into the difficult part of analyzing each and every poem that we are prescribed this year.